Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our uh, Zoom question and answer session with uh, Ruth uh, Richmond from Bayes and Simon Ayers from Trustmark. Um, and just as we've said that, Ruth has disappeared again. Um, I was about to say we're going to kick into this as quickly as possible. We've got a lot of questions to go through. A um, lot of concerns about um, vouchers um, and hopefully Ruth and uh, uh, Simon can, can get through uh, or come up with some answers for us on some of these questions. Um, I, I believe Ian Rippon is uh, uh, about as well. Um, uh, if there are questions on, for MCS, we might be able to get some answers on those. Um, and we should be able to get some answers on anything to do with the uh, app as well. So Ruth's back. Let's kick off with asking for the usual update from Bayes on where we are with everything, basically, and how things moved on from the last month. Hello, everybody. Um, so uh, I just wanted to apologise as a as a starting point because um, I've had we've got I've got some issues with my with my IT this morning. I think it's what we had a power cut earlier this morning, and my internet seems to be being really flaky ever since. So I will try. I will go as long as I can. Um, hopefully, it'll hopefully it's settled down now because we sit the power certainly is back. The lights are on behind me. Um, and if um if uh, if uh, yeah if I do drop out unexpectedly, it, the power disappearing on and off again. There's a building that opposite me, and I think they might have knocked something because the power's been dropping in and out all morning but we'll see how things go for now um, so uh, in terms of a quick update um, we've got around 50,000 applications in now um, and I think there are around 700 registered installers now um, so uh, they're, 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 that's not the exact numbers but there's the sort of region we're in um, and I think there is still something like 300 installer applications in the system being processed as well. Um, but I, I know we're sort of getting through those quite quickly now with resolving the issues that were left with them. Um, so hopefully lots of you have now received, you know, had now had had customers who've received vouchers and have been able to start getting some work done under the scheme. And hopefully we're beginning to turn the corner on this with more vouchers coming out. Um, so it, I was going to quickly talk about, because I know that you'll be aware that there have always been more applications in than there have been vouchers out yet. So I thought I would talk briefly about some of the chat, some of the problems we're coming across or ICF are coming across with the, um, with the applications they're getting for vouchers. Um, just to try and provide a bit of context on these, because I appreciate it's very frustrating when you know that your customer put an application in in September and they still haven't had a voucher back out the other end. Um, so there've been, there are a number of issues that are causing applications that are causing problems with applications. Um, sometimes it's quite a lot of them to do with um, identity checks. So we have to be able to prove that the consumer is a, gen is a genuine customer, that they're you know, a genuine person that's making an application, that it's not fraudulent, that it's not, um, you know, that it's not something like, you know, it's not something where perhaps, you know, some dodgy door knocking company has gone round and like put something in on on a consumer's on some old lady's behalf you know we have to check that it's a genuine application um with these there are back when there's a there's there are checks that are done automatically if they fail on those there are then we then follow up with the they don't just reject it straight away they follow up with the customer and check whether there is some and what the way to prove it but obviously that takes a bit of time to do and if the customer takes a while to send in their paperwork again it takes a bit of time so that's one of the things that's failing um, there's another one around making sure that the applicant actually owns the house um, because they have to they have to they have to they have has to be the has to be the homeowner um, again it's an automated check there are a few places it's failing and so we're again we're having to follow up it's again it's a simple bit of paperwork that the consumer can apply can send in and solve it but it takes a bit of time so it slows things down um, the third bit that's causing again is if they're on the ten thousand pounds voucher um, we then we have to check with DWP to check the benefits information um, and so again there's a few people failing there who are in the 10,000 application 10,000 pound applications um, so there, there's there's three of the main things um, there has at least, there, a few of the applicants haven't put haven't put haven't sent their quotes in um, in at least one case they sent in a picture of a cat 
which was obviously very helpful. Um, so there's, so there are a few of those. Um, so there, so some of them are being held up because there isn't quote there isn't quote information on them at all. Um, we also had a few other duplicate applications, and so they're in the process. Obviously, that they're, they're an easier one for to weed out. The system can weed those out, but it takes it takes a bit of time to go through all those sorts of things. Um, and so there's a what and what we're doing now. We've been working with with the scheme administrator, so they can send out an email, basically an email that goes out to an applicant and tells them all the things that they need to provide to get this to get their application moving. Um, and we're doing that in bulk, so there will probably be a few going out over the next over the next week or so. As um, as we're going, you know, we've got a bucket of things that have this problem, so we're going out in bulk to them and getting that information back in, so we can get them processed. Um, now, quotes. I know we spoke about um, about about quotes and the information needed on them last time, and I know there's been a few questions on that as well. Um, and one of the things I wanted to feedback was actually to thanks to all of you because actually there are some where we've had some really good quotes coming in. Um, and so, you know, and they're, they're really helpful and are just able to go straight through that any problem. So we've been really glad to see those. Um, we've, one of the things we've done actually is it's now not possible for an applicant to apply without putting a quote on, which it used to be. So we've taken that out the system to try and to try and reduce the need for this going back late, going back to chase up quotes and things. Um, I I do know that there's been some questions that have come in around around the quote guidance. Um, so it's and I guess we can cover those when we get to them. Um, I we are one of the things we're doing is we're working with we we are working with the scheme minister on this to see if we can we can make those requirements a bit. There there are places where we can probably relax those requirements very slightly, particularly for for um, for applications that were made before the guide, the guidance was published. Um, so we're we're working with scheme ministries to try and try and make that change so as to reduce the amount of quotes that needs to be redone. Because I understand that's very frustrating for all of you, um, and so we're, we're working on that um, as well. Um, and I know there was a there was an issue that's come up in the last week or so where quotes have expired in the in the intervening period between when a consumer put their application in and, and the voucher being processed. Um, we are trying to be more flexible with these because clearly um, we don't you know we don't want that that's, it sounds it's quite processy for us to say oh no that quote's expired. So we are trying not we're trying to be more flexible with these. I understand that some of you may have already received um, requests to redo those quotes. Um, and obviously, I apologise for that. We are trying to be more flexible with those to try and get a bit more, because equally, if there might be situations in which you do want to update those quotes if they've expired, and we don't want to sort of, you know, to issue an, a voucher that then has to be reissued because of that. So there's there's a fine line here, obviously, with getting it right. Um, but generally, if you can confirm that the quote the quote is still valid, we should be able to process that. So we're trying to trying to get that through. Um, so I think they were the main things I wanted to say. Um, and obviously happy to take any questions on on I know there's quite a lot of questions coming in so um but I, I so yeah I'll, I'll leave it there thank you very much Ruth that um as ever very helpful and informative um at least it gives us some answers on what the what the delays have been and where the issues are um uh Simon I don't know if you want to say something from Trustmark before we get on to general questions I think I can just a couple of minutes, if I may. Um, sure. Just, just really in terms of an update. So, um, in terms of Trustmark, then we are in a place now where we have seen the first vouchers coming through. So there have been some, um, I think, questions. I believe around not being able to lodge work. The reason you couldn't lodge the work is we didn't have the voucher details. We are now seeing those coming through. So I, we've got the first 4,000 plus yet in the last six to eight hours. So anyone that's had challenges with lodgement in the last few days um, with early vouchers, they are now available. Yep, so lodgement should now start happening. Yep, so that can take place. I think there's been some questions um, also around compliance and audit. So just to be very clear, Trustmark will be doing 10% desktop and 10% on-site auditing for quality. And there will also be fraud checks being undertaken on the work that's also coming through. So I would ask you to ensure that you are, wherever possible, making sure that the lodgements 
have all the correct information and all the correct yet yeah, details required. Because what we don't want to do is get you up and running and delivering vouchers to find out then that there are challenges around quality, yeah, which would mean that you could then actually get stopped again. So we, we've got to sort of create this circle. But the other thing I think, and I spoke about it previously, which is a really interesting fact in, you know, and yes, there have been some teething problems here. And um, I think everyone has been absolutely working flat out to try to get these resolved. Um, is that we mustn't forget that we have the extension on the scheme. You know, we have the LAD scheme. So the LAD scheme is in three parts. You know, LAD 1, 1B and 2. So um, LAD 1 and 1B was based or is based upon the original design. So you would be delivering under a slightly set of, or slightly different set of requirements. LAD 2, which comes into play next year, will require PAS 2030, 19 and 2035. So let's just be very clear that the first two elements, yeah, are on a set of rules that were pre-designed. The next set will be the full PAS. So, you know, so we're being very clear about those areas. Um, I think there's been some other questions around automation of uploads. The automated third party uploads at the moment are for eco only. So for people like EcoServe and some of the other businesses, yeah, then that would take place through their system for Eco. It has not been designed for the Green Home Grant Scheme. You know, right? So that API doesn't exist at this moment in time. So I think you know, we, we're, we're in a case when we get into next year, when it's up and running, we now have the time to build those and we can work with those, but there is different information in different areas. Um, the other thing I would ask in something that we've seen on the audits we're now starting to do on the eco work is when you are sending through warranties yeah, for the work, can you please make sure they are valid? All right. Sending me a plan as a warranty really doesn't comply. You know, so um, we do need to ensure that the consumer is protected because that is the absolute key here. All right. That longer term. The, the reason we're putting all this effort into fraud, all this effort into the admin, is to make sure that the, we're sort of moving forward. And I think the last thing as well, and I, I saw a couple of the questions, and rather than coming as questions, Councillor, I'll probably pick them off now if I may, which is, yeah. you know, um, Trustmark registration, and I'm really very clear about this, at this moment in time, is a £40 fee paid yet yeah, per business per annum. The fees you pay to CBs and the scheme provider are set by the scheme providers. So, you know, some of those will be 150 quid, some might be 500 quid. I don't know. That's for you to engage with the scheme provider on that basis. And the certification is very much based upon who you speak to as a CB. Um, and it's also in the areas of work that you undertake. So I think, you know, they all offer different services. And um, I've had some feedback in the last 24 hours about some of the CBs not actually covering all the different areas and the measures, which is cause frustration. And we will take that back to the CBs, right? Because it's one of those areas that we have to pick up. The other thing that's worth saying is that we are also now looking as we move into the new year to support, you know, all the existing PAS registered businesses and those that want to come through um, with some different options really in terms of how we support people achieving the PAS registration. So that would very much be picking up the micros and the SMEs. Um, the Bayes competition that ran, um, I'm sure you're all aware that that's now um, out and there are people starting to offer services. A number of them have come to us and they've got money, A, to take people through things like the QMS, the training, which would all be funded. But also there are some grants that would be included within that funding if you go through there towards certification. So that would be really suited to a smaller business that might have those challenges around some of the finances. So there's, there's an awful lot of taking place to now start to put measures in play to support and move forward. And we still have lots of other areas to pick up. You know, I know there are some questions around, um, and I'm sure Ruth hasn't, one of them will come up, which is about voucher validity. If you issue a voucher in March, will it roll through? There are policy decisions which are, you know, are all being discussed and in, in being clarified. So um, it is a watching space. Um, a, an obvious question that's coming up lots of times, Kenneth, also is about 
um, whether it can be blended with eco. They can't, they are two very separate things. Yeah, so that, you know, you've got different rules. So we are trying now, yeah, um, to really make sure that we are um, starting to cover all the different areas and get really sort of some clarity around the information, which has been confusing, yeah, for a period of time. And we're, we're all busy. Our contact centres are flat out, you know, flat out with consumers, flat out with installers, um, you know, and we are trying now to liaise with ICF to make sure that actually there's communication um, commonality between the two centres when people are talking to them so that you're not getting different messages. I think that's an overview, Kenneth, of where we are. Okay. Pretty well. Thank you very much, Simon. Again, very useful. Um, so uh, I guess it is now um, uh, it's now a case of looking at the questions that have come in um, over the last couple of days. And I think the first question um, we have is well, a question here from Scott Davies uh, from GHE Solar. When does the scheme administrator realistically envisage getting to the point that they can actually turn voucher applications around in five days? Um, don't know if you were able to answer that one, Ruth? That is a good question and um, one I would also like to know the answer to if I'm entirely honest. Uh, what I would say is that we are working very hard with the scheme administrator to get the system up and running, get the like properly up and running because it's, sort of, it's obviously partly up and running because vouchers are coming out but not, not at the rate we would like. Um, so you know, get everything properly up and running, get all the systems working, get everything in place. Um, I mean, it's, I think there has been a definite improvement in the last, in the la over the last, in the, in the in the past, you know, three four weeks, whatever it was we last spoke. Um, I, all I can say is we're working on it, and you know, with, this is something that is of key importance to us in base. So we are really pushing on this at the moment, and I I would think we're getting as close to it as we can as soon as we can. I'm afraid that's the best I can say at the moment. Okay. Um... Uh, I, I think that's something that we'll keep pestering you with, Ruth, because that's that's one that that we do need an answer to sooner rather than than later, really. Um, uh, I don't know if you want to come back on that, Scott, at all. Um, Scott, there. No, I'm. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's fine. I mean, it's it's you know we appreciate it's a big task and. Um, you know, everybody's working towards it, but yeah, it's just if, if we could sort of as soon as possible get some sort of just realistic information, to be honest with you, even if it's not good, in, you know, even if it's not what we probably want to hear, just maybe just be kept updated on it. Um, yeah, just, just so, you know, as installers, we can plan, do we take more resources on? Do we, you know, get ourselves in a position where we can start delivering? Um, and yeah, it's just, yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, even if it's not what we want to hear, just to have that information kind of fed back to us. That's all, thanks. But appreciate it, Ruth. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Um, next question I have here is from uh, Jessica Binks from Improve Easy. Um, she's basically saying that um, the finding that £10,000 grant is not always sufficient to cover the full cost of external wall insulation, uh, for example, end of terrestrial or semi-detached properties with large gable ends, um, where the customer can't afford any, any contribution. Um, and the 10000 would only cover the insulation of some of the walls. Um, we're currently not proceeding on the basis that it's preferable for the, proper, for the property for all heat loss walls to be treated. However, we are conscious that this means that the customers who are eligible for the scheme and in properties needing insulation, that we're unable to help. Is it acceptable in these circumstances to proceed with installation of some walls with ventilation improvements made as required and to provide the customer with a medium term plan for insulation of other walls at a later date? Alternatively, will the funding caps be reviewed uh, and could consideration be made to allow greater funding for some measures or for larger properties? So unfortunately we can't offer any additional funding at the moment. Um, it'd be great if we could. Um, the, what I would say is that I, I, you know, generally we'd agree it's better to not partially insulate. If you do, then the approach you've set out, it, that, that Jessica has set out is, is 
obviously the best one to do as long as you do it in line with the standards and, and provide the, the medium term plan and the ventilation that is the way to do it if you're going to it obviously is better to do a full home if you can um what i can do however is take that away and check whether that might be eligible for any of the other schemes that and check whether that would apply for any of the other schemes that we have because actually it might be that that would be that sort of project where it's coming in above 10,000 per month better than someone else. So let, let me take that away and just check if there's anything else we can we can say on that. Can, can I just add something there, Ruth? Yeah. So just so um, everyone's aware, past 2035, then the medium term plan is not a get out of jail free card to do partial insulation um, in the plan. It's worth saying in to support what Ruth has just said, that there's been a, a lot of discussions in industry in the last probably four to six weeks um, and there is a new set of industry guidance due to come out yet yeah, which will be issued through off gem and through bays yet yeah, which will support the whole process yet yeah, around um, the partial measures yet yeah, and how the, the property is left so that's due to come out as will other areas in the future as well around room and roof and um, underfloor all right, but the, the partial insulation one is one that um, is being worked on currently. Do we have any timeline for that? Um, the timeline, I think, for those, some of you may have been involved in those conversations, actually, because this is a, a, a massive sort of question going on eco at the moment. Yeah, um, is that that's coming through as quickly as they can get it ready. Kind of. So it will be, I can't give you a date, but it is being worked on as we speak. Okay. Um, do you want to come back on that, uh, uh, Jessica? Oh, sorry, David, you, were you wanting to say something there? Yeah, uh, thank you. I was just quickly chime in. So there is additional guidance on, on the installation measures on, on the scheme website. It says if you install external solid wall insulation to a wall, you must insulate all suitable space on that wall. While it is advisable to insulate all the external walls of your property, this is not a requirement of the scheme. I don't know if that's a requirement of PAS. I think you you can't deviate from the PAS. So okay. Yeah. So the PAS still has an oversight, which is, you know, yep. you cannot we cannot do something which leaves a consumer or a property in detriment. So that's why the new guidance will be coming out, and that yep. guidance will be clear in terms of what has to be delivered. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, do you want to come back on that, Jessica? Yeah, thanks, uh, Ruth and, and Simon. I mean, that, that's, that's helpful. It's, it, you know, it's similar to what we thought the advice would be. I mean, obviously, our, our preference is still always to do 100% of the property where we can. I think just one other question, because obviously for external wall insulation, uh, as it currently stands, you're able to do that under the PAS 2030-2017 um, standard um, and a medium term improvement plan is PAS 2030-2019-2035 requirement. So would that mean you're really effectively, if it's a less than 100% installed, you would have to do those as a 2019 PAS 2035 process, you know, send out a retrofit assessor have a retrofit coordinator oversee that project and so on. Um, I think that's covered in some of the guidance that's coming out, Jessica. So, because that's obviously one of the big debates that's been that there are still 20, 30, 17 delivery options, um, but where they move into higher risk and where there are the additional requirements, then that's where it obviously moves to 2030, 19, 2035. Um, and I think that's been one of the big debates. So I I would just say it's worth hang, hanging fire while we wait to see this guidance. Yeah. At the moment, basically, if we get any properties like this, we are holding, holding them back at the moment. So thank you very much for the updates. Okay, thank you. Um, then we've got um, a the next question um, from uh, kind of following on from uh, from that on insulation, um, Alan Hoy from Oscar uh, is asking: Can we get detailed clarification regarding the scope of enabling work that can be included in the green home vouchers scheme? 
um, specifically around cavity wall extraction. And we also have another question from uh, uh, another question that came in um, from Bobby Cook of Cooka Developments uh, asking uh, how can CI, uh, cavity wall insulation be topped up without extracting as there are too many variables and blind spots to which you cannot see whether it will be uh, it will work or be suitable without the cavity being clear. Um, so how are you going to identify which cavities need topping up? Um, so that's that, that's two questions uh, on uh, enabling works, especially relating to cavity walls. Um, so on the the first question about uh, detailed clarification around enabling work. Now, obviously, we can't provide guidance for every single situation that could ever arise on this, which is why we haven't. Um, you know, if we, we said, oh, this stuff's eligible, then you'd almost certainly find another house that had something slightly different on it, and there'd be a question about then that wouldn't be. And there's what we, whereas what we prefer to say that if it is, you know, required for the proper, you know, to carry out the job properly, then it should, then it's enabling work. Um, within that, we can provide more, more specific um, responses if people have specific questions, but this is probably not the place to do that. Um, on extraction, we have specifically said that is not included. Um, I think we've specifically said that before. So yeah. um, top ups, I agree, is a bit more complex. Um, and I would need to check exactly what we've said in our guidance on that because I know it's, I know it's more complex than that. Uh, I don't know if Bobby or Alan want to come back on on that either of you no doesn't look look like it so we shall move on then um to um next question from gary bosher um uh, this is one that you've sort of covered simon um uh, but I think also looking at from the, the site, uh, site line app as well, uh, could we use the EcoServe software for the in, uh, installation of the Green Home Grants measures? We're currently using this for all our eco measures and all our uh, installers and office staff understand how this works and also provide, it also provides geotags and all photos with timestamp. So they're basically asking, um, is, could that be used as an alternative? To the site line um, and also does it work with Trustmark? So site line is a requirement by ICF so I think that's a, a very straight answer on that one um, and as I said earlier we don't have APIs yet between EcoServe and some of the other third-party software for the Green Home yeah. Grant Scheme that's very much for Eco. So, um, so but site line is a requirement and it's what the you, you sign up to in the terms and conditions. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if Gary Bosher wants to respond to that. No. Um, then we will move on to the um, next question, which I have here from uh, Scott, uh, Scott Davies, because uh, it also falls on the site, uh, site line. Uh, question how do we know if something has been su submitted successfully from the sightline app is there any way to check what the installer has sent um, for example an admin portal or summary um, that's a similar question to that's come in from a number of people who seem to have concerns about not being able to see what has been submitted um, so that, I know that was covered a little bit last month but um, uh, anyone want to answer I can, that? One? I can take that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I've gotten that feedback as well, and at the moment there is no feedback mechanism. It is something that we are looking at incorporating at some point in the future. Uh, it would be more just a email sent or you know form sent pop up um, because of data security reasons we can't have information from 
the, the form stored on the device. So once it is sent, it's off the device uh, and it's not possible to look at it um, and, and unless you're on, on the other side of, of the fence. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, th I think that's uh, Scott. Do you want to to come back on that? Yeah, I just think I mean it's kind of even if it was just an email, it's I think it's really important because you know you've got installers on site that are making those submissions. Um, you know, potentially you, you've done a job. You're not you you know you don't know if it's happened. You don't know if it's been submitted properly, and the first thing you're going to know about it is when the customer maybe you know information comes back by that point it's too late and you're going to lose the job and not get paid for something which is you know relatively minor um if you've taken it all but you know how many times have you clicked on a website and you know it hasn't been sent through it's just just some kind of you know i think it's really really important just to have some kind of um yeah receipt or something yeah thank you yep noted Thanks, Scott. Um, th uh, thanks, David, as well. Um, uh, then we're going on to a um, question about air source heat pumps. Um, uh, in the, so this is from Jake Cook from C12. Uh, in the guidance published by Bayes on air source heat pumps, um, they detail two installation methods. One where the heat pump provides both space heating and domestic heating domestic water heating, sorry, and a hybrid option, if opting for the second version, that is a new boiler must be installed. What would be the rules for a third option where the heat pump just provides the space heating only and the domestic water heating is con continues to be provided from the existing source? I'm afraid that wouldn't be eligible for the scheme. It wouldn't be eligible. Okay. Um, Jake, do you want to come back on that? Uh, yeah, it was just to say because under the second hybrid option, they have to have a new boiler fitted, um, which isn't covered by the scheme. So if you're fitting a hybrid option in a customer that's on a 10 grand voucher, they're going to be on benefits. They may have just had that boiler fitted under Eco a few weeks earlier. So then we're telling them they have to pay for a new boiler to be fitted. So we're just trying to look at another option where they can uh, leave the existing boiler in place and they can still have a heat pump fitted, but the heat pump then just does the central heating and the existing boiler carries on doing the hot water. But also it's good that way, it gives them the option at a later date, they might want to have solar thermal as well. So it's just because it's not, it doesn't, it's not specific and it doesn't say in the guidance whether it's prohibited or not. Um, but I know a lot of installers are looking at doing that, the third option, because it doesn't say you can't. So you need to be more specific, really, as to whether so, or not it's allowed. Okay, yeah, we're actually looking at updating the guidance to make that a bit clearer, but it, the guidance does say specifically that the whole heating system has to be replaced. Yeah. Um, but we're looking at making it clearer to make it apparent that this option isn't, <laughs> isn't acceptable. Um, yeah, because, uh, yeah, we, we, we've had a few inquiries on it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, that's fine. I just know a lot of people looking at the third option because it says you're not allowed. It doesn't say you're not allowed, so that's why they're thinking of going ahead with that. But obviously, it's going to be clearer than that. But what about the situation where you have a customer then that is uh, in receipt of benefits and then just had a new boiler fit under eco a few weeks previous? Would that have to be replaced? Um, yes, and I agree that's not ideal. Um, but it, unfortunately, it's difficult to say, oh, if this, in this situation will do this and that situation will do that. What we really want to do is to it's part of the sort of future transition to heat, to renewable heat. Really, we want people to be not moving to hybrids. We want them to be moving to the whole, whole clean heat system. Um, and so we don't really want to be encouraging people to keep older boilers and yeah. sort of supplement them with a heat pump. We prefer them just to move to the heat pump. Yeah, um, and so that's why, that's why the, the, the rules are as they are. Um, but yeah, I agree. If someone had literally just had a new boiler, that wouldn't really be ideal. No. Yeah, exactly. Probably, uh, particularly if they have to pay for a new boiler to go in, it wouldn't be able to do that, I don't think. But anyway, yeah. Okay, as long as we understand the guidance, then that's fine. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ruth. Thanks for your help. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Um, the, uh, then uh, another question from Jessica Binks. Um, again, on air source heat pumps. Um, with the, air, the hybrid air source heat pump is installed, the 
requirements state that the fossil fuel heat source must be newly installed. If the customer meets the relevant scheme eligibility requirements, can the replacement gas boiler be funded by ECO alongside the green home gas voucher used for the hybrid uh, air source heat pump? So I had to check this with my ECO colleagues this morning as I'm not an expert on ECO rules, but it turns out not. Um, so, because uh, uh, I think they, obviously they really want ECO to be pushing towards insulation rather than heating, where obviously it does still fund boilers, but they don't, they don't want to be funding part boilers, basically part systems. So they've said, no, this, it's not, it wouldn't be eligible for ECO. Do you want to come back on that, Jessica? I think, yeah, I think if that's a decision, it'd be useful to make that really clear on the website because I know that a lot of um, eco heating installers are looking at moving into um, fitting hybrid air source heat pumps, you know, and, and doing that alongside um, an eco boiler and possibly eco funded insulation as well. So if, if that's the decision, it, it would be helpful to make that clear really quickly. Yeah, I'll take that away and get get that. Try, we'll try and get that clarified. Make it make it clear for everyone. Okay, thank you. Um, the the next question um, we have is from Neil Walker from Watford Borough Council. Um, how do we go about updating the Green Home Grant voucher applications already submitted? We'd ideally like to do this from the contractor on the resident's behalf using their Green Home Grant application reference number to avoid any confusion and dropouts. Uh, the overall price remains the same, but there is more detail as requested by Bayes and the scheme uh, administrator. So how do they go about updating the voucher application submission? Uh, David, am I right in that we can take that you can take this by email to the customer contact centre, or, do, or do, does it need to? Is it does it need to come in on the system? Uh, it has to be initiated by the customer, and I believe it would go through the contact centre. So sorry, could I just chip in there? This is Neil from Watford. Um, what what is the email? Uh, contact because I, I got through to a form where you couldn't attach up you couldn't attach anything uh, so there are, <clears throat> there are two email addresses uh, and I can put them in the chat window one is for customers to use and so if you wanted the customer wanted to amend their form or their submission that's what they would use but we can't, um, can the contract, can we use the one that the contractor can upload the revised quote? Uh, so yeah, and that's that's the second one that I just put in for uh, installers to use. Okay, so is, is that the best advice that you, you could give us on that? Should we wait until we're contacted by Green Homes Grant or should we just upload the revised template quotes now? Um, so you, let me make sure I'm understanding. You're asking, you want to submit an updated quote and you're wondering Following should you the wait? New, the new Bayes guidance templates because the quote, the price remains the same, but the initial quotes we uploaded were before Bayes guidance came out. Okay. Yeah, you don't need to wait. If you, if you know you're going to need to provide additional details, you can upload the quote. And for that, you should use the installer at Great. the email address. Thank you. Great. Yep. Okay, but um, we've had an, uh, uh, another question on um, Park Homes um, from um, uh, Keith, uh, uh, oh, sorry, from Anne Baradine. When will the best practice guidelines on Park Homes be ready? Um, and under the uh, local authority, uh, uh, or under the LAD scheme, some local authorities have installers putting mineral wool insulation on park homes where the chassis will be unable to bear the weight so the homeowners will be left with a problem in the next 10 years um, and the council will not be uh, looking to pay more to correct the problem at that point. Um, so uh, when, uh, when will best practice for park homes be ready? 
So I'm not entirely aware of what this this is. Is this something that um, this question? Yeah, the question that came in this morning. Um, I don't. Know, do you want to clarify it, Anne? Yeah, it's knowing what the guidelines are in different situations because there are no guidelines, so it's open to interpretation. And to be able to protect the home owner, guidelines need to be in place. They are for houses, for installing external wall insulation or installing a boiler, but where it comes to park homes, there's no guidelines. Yeah, I'm going to follow on from that, Anne, um, if I can, by um, uh, just bringing in Keith Hanger here, uh, who's asked, the technical guidelines for installing various measures, such as insulating park homes, seem remarkably vague and inconsistent. Mm -hmm. What is the process for installers and manufacturers to get the technical guidance and standards changed quickly before too many incorrect installations are carried out? Kenneth, can I come in there? Yeah. The Ruth answer to Anne's question, Ruth, it's not something Ruth would be aware of because yeah. it's probably not basic dealing with that. So I don't want people to think that Ruth doesn't know the answer. It's not. A, it's something that Ruth will definitely not know much about because she'll not have been know much know about it. So I want to defend her in that case. Uh, well, no, no, I want to, well, it's but, more one know. for Trustmark. If they've got yeah. to audit it and install, unless photographs are supplied at every single stage, this won't make any difference if it's park homes or anything. But well, how can you audit something when there's no guidelines to follow? Yeah. That's for Trustmark. Just ask, can I just ask a question first, just for my clarification, because I'm no technical expert, but there is a British standard, I believe, for. No. Park homes? BS3632, but nothing to do with insulation. So there are no guidelines. I thought there were guidelines issued from the National Caravan Council. Um, Kenneth or Simon, yep. uh, it's, Keith, it's Keith here who put the question in. Um, hi, Anne. Obviously, Anne and myself work directly to, in the park home industry. And what, you know, the question Anne asked um, is very valid that there needs to be this guideline. Simon, I know you were in discussions with. Um, my fellow uh, NCC guy, John, the chairman of the NCC, J John Lally, who yeah. oversees the whole of our industry. And Kenneth, as you're aware, over these last four weeks and getting involved in these Zoom meetings, I have been pressing for um, a working party for the industry. Um, and having spent 36 years manufacturing and uh, refurbishing park homes, um, we have all that information and as Anne said, it's um, <laughs> to put it kindly and I'm trying to keep this as kind as possible, I've, we're being ignored. The, the PAS 2035 does not cover what, how this work should be done on park homes and that's what Anne, you know, to support Anne and her company, I'm, I'm coming from the NCC side, you know, to say, just talk to us, sit down with us, and we will come up very quickly with a system uh, to enable Anne and, and many companies like it to get on with it under those, we will form an umbrella for the park home industry. Keith, wasn't it one of the actions that came out of conversations that we were looking at how there would be a best practice guide created? And I thought... One of my colleagues had conversations with John about that. Um, to this point, uh, I haven't spoken to John in the last couple of weeks, but John had hit a brick wall a few weeks back, which is when I became involved. And he asked, he, he asked me, or we discussed it, and he asked me to be the spokesman for the industry um, with the biggest manufacturer of park homes in the UK um, mm -hmm. and the main refurbishment company for 30 years. So that's the history. Um, there is no, we are, we are getting no rhetoric. Okay. The industry is getting no better. And I think, yeah, and I think there have been some, there were a number of questions that were being asked about input into past 2035 and all those other areas, not, not for today, but ones that I know have been raised. And I think, Anne, your point in terms of audit and compliance, then... That's what I'm concerned about. Yeah, then there, there are, there there are the requirements. Guide, there is a guide, but they're but rewriting it. Sorry? There are requirements being put into play for things yeah. like pre-post, yeah, well, pre-mid and post-inspection, 
um, because that's you know we're, we're as concerned as everyone about making sure this is done correctly so i think mm. i know ruth you've had some conversations with john and some of his team in the past yeah well, so. which i need to follow up on i mean if, if we maybe we need to have a separate conversation about, about park homes yeah. just all the people who are interested in these things i'm happy to dial in obviously i can't i'm not obviously i obviously i don't know great stuff about this but i'm happy to sort of dial in and make sure that we're you know fully informed on this stuff and let's let's try and let's try and work out what what needs to happen and try and make sure that it happens yeah. and I, I think that's yeah. absolutely really. to be as well keith which is and for you Anne, which would be yeah you know let's get something together um uh, yeah i'm no technical expert we'll get our compliance guys and we look at what has to be done to try now to make sure that we're all working in the same, the same direction you just want yeah, it done yeah uh Ruth, um, sorry to, to come in again, just one very quickly, because I, I realise you've got a lot of other people involved. But Ruth, yeah, if you could, if you could um, uh, get, dis get to uh, some rhetoric going with uh, John Lally of the NCC, and then hopefully myself and Anne and, and some, other, you know, some of the other contractors can, can put this sort of work in practice together swiftly so that you know, Anne, Anne and the others particularly can get on and get these, these jobs done. I think it will help. It will help the whole grant scheme uh, ensure that the money goes to the right people doing the right job in the right places. I can just come in there. That's not a base issue of technical standards. That's an, base don't get base shouldn't be involved in that. Well, it's a case of it. I think um, if Ruth or Bayes can facilitate the, the I guess I'm, I'm keen to know that standards are in place and they're adequate or, or else I don't want to be giving money out. So let's let's have let's. So I'll be involved from that perspective. But while obviously, yes, of course, standards should be industry led. It's, you know, so let's um, let's, I, let's have a conversation about that separately. Let's let's. I, let's, I would let's also like to ask a question. Is this what's holding back back home vouchers? Well, so the main thing, I, I can actually have, got, I've, I've, and Ian, I've mean, I've been meaning to come back to you on that actually. So I know you 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 sent us in a, a question about it, hadn't you? And um, so the main thing that is holding back park home vouchers at the moment um, is that quite a lot of the park home applications are failing on the um, on the own whether the whether the applicant owns it or not. Well, Obviously okay. they do, but they don't come up on the searches we're doing because they're not standard houses, which. So we, there is, there's, there's paperwork they can provide that will and that that will solve that for them. It's you know it's a council tax bill and a, a pitch agreement. So if, when they send that, they should be getting emails out. I think later this week, basically asking for asking for their their their, their pitch. I think they're called pitch rental agreements and um and their um and their council tax bills. If they can, and a council tax bill, if they can send those in, then we then we should be able to get these vouchers out quite quickly. I, I understand oh, yeah. that those ones are, are otherwise not so not so difficult as yeah. as some of the other problem, ones we're having. So I think because a lot of the quotes, because I think they're all quite they, they all make a lot of sense. I think the challenges are on the the uh, establishing ownership rather than on any of the other more complicated things we're, we're coming across on them. Good, That's good, all. Um, Thanks very much. Apologies for interjecting. I I don't usually jump into these things, but um, my, my background has come from the insurance back guarantee marketplace. <clears throat> and um, one of the projects I was working on when I first started working there was with regards to specifically park homes and the inherent problem that we tend to find with regard to any kind of remediation for park home is that the park home owner will not allow anybody to go on site to conduct the surveys and they have relevant agreements with the, um, the, the manufacturers no. so they will make more money from the recycling of the park home and so I, I, I know obviously I'm, you, you are a lot more experienced in this all I'm saying is from my side of it when we were trying to put an insurance back guarantee system together to allow remediation for park homes the first thing that we came across was that you could only get a grant for the external however you could not do that unless the roof space and the underfloor space could be insulated as well that then left the occupant with a bill of, for argument's sake, anywhere between three and five thousand pounds, which they couldn't afford. So with GDGC, we split the guarantee system and allowed one guarantee for the external, one for the room and roof or the loft, one for the underfloor to allow that to be done. But we found that anybody who was attempting to try and do remedial works for park homes were blocked off by the park home owner because 
as I say, they saw more profit in the scrappage, recycling and selling of a new product. And that, that is one thing that I came across when we were trying to put this together and make it more attractive to installers and also make it more amenable to the, um, the occupant. Ultimately, unfortunately, the guarantee agency tripled the cost of the guarantee, which again made that unreachable because why would you charge £90 for an EWI guarantee and then £90 for the roof and £90 for the floor? You're talking over £300, including VAT, purely for the guarantee. So the whole premise within that is putting off the installer from trying to approach it because there are so many blocks across the, the way. And as you will know as well, without the relevant stipulation from the managing agents, from the government grant funding schemes, and from those who can provide the occupants with a better standard of living, we're all reaching a, a crossroads that nobody can get through because every single light is on red. And what we need to do, as you say, Keith, yourself, to create a collaborative approach. Now that collaboration will not come from the manufacturer because they want to shift their product, you know? Um, but we need to try and work that out with the installers, with the, the manufacturers and system designers and the occupants and try and work with the occupants to allow access to site so we can recommend remedial works as opposed to wait for a landlord or a managing agent that owns that site to say, no, we don't want you coming on here because we don't want to remediate it. What we want to do is just scrap that off. Okay. Trade it in. Right. Can, I just, can I just very briefly say, Kenneth, thanks Ian, and, 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 and I get where uh, Ian's coming from. The actual f fact is, as Anne was about to say, and I'm in agreement with Anne, is 99% of park home estates have full access for refurbishment. 99% and, and they cannot, by law, this is where our industry needs to be uh, involved in it. And I, am, I come from the industry, not, as, not necessarily as a business, need to um, look at that because uh, they, they can't refuse the right for these homes to be refused. There is law around that. Sorry, this is getting uh, into a part of the debate. Yeah. We've, got to, we've got to stop this. We've got to move on. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's enough of you on here. There's about half a dozen of you. If you can all exchange details through the chat, and then, you know, if one of you wants to set up, because obviously yeah. we're not going to, if somebody else wants to set up you all getting together, then please, you know, feel free. But I think we need to move on. There's other questions, yeah. and there's a lot of people on here. Uh, we're spending a long time doing this, but it's good that it's been approached. Um, okay. It was needed, but now you've got the nucleus to crack on. Thank you, Gary. Um, I, and uh, we we shall move on now, and hopefully um, uh, we can cover up the next question, which is from uh, Rachel Cole at Bid Connector. Um, we're completing our first Green Home Grant install on Friday. In order to submit the job once completed, we need the following. The correct declaration of conformity. Uh, this is required to lodge the measure in the Trustmark data warehouse. Access to the trusted uh, Trustmark data warehouse for the Green Home Grant Scheme. Um, uh, we have this for Eco, but not for Green Home Grant Scheme. Uh, we don't have the have either of these things. Uh, can the declaration of conformity be issued urgently and access to the data warehouse? Be arranged, um, which you sort of covered, Simon. But um, a, can, is there any idea of what the the hold up on the declaration of conformity is? I'm not quite sure. I understand that whole question, Kenneth. Kind of sorry, which is oh. the the declaration is a declaration which is being used widely already. Okay. Um, what is the expectation we are providing a declaration? Rachel, are you wanting to to come in on that? Yeah, well, I've, I've, I've checked the rules for lodgement. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Rachel, we're having difficulty hearing you. I'll move closer to my laptop. I'm having technical issues today as well. Can you yeah. hear me now? That's much better, yeah. Um, yeah, I've checked the requirements for lodgement and it says that there needs to be a signed declaration of conformity from the customer. 
Now, ordinarily, under ECO, we have an ECO approved declaration of conformity. No, oh, hang on, you've gone away again. That declares the products that have been used, the percentage that's been installed, and confirms that the installer is qualified, that the organisation is certified, and that the customer is happy with the work that's been done. And I don't believe I've seen one for Green Homes Grant. Um, the Declaration of Conformity, I think, requires the same information. So, um, providing there there is confirmation of all the areas you've just spoken about, then that's the declaration. But we can use the eco one because that was certainly my plan for the installation. Tomorrow. Yeah. No, Rachel. Yeah, no, that 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 should be fine because what what we're after is a declaration to say that. The work has been completed to the right standard, meeting the, the right conditions, it's protected in you know in basically that everything meets the standards as it should do. And my other question, which I think you've partially answered, although I don't know if you've answered it for us, um, is um, we don't actually have a button on our portal, or we didn't at 1700 last night, to actually lodge to the GHG data warehouse. We've had some communication with the Green Homes Grant team. And I think they said they were waiting for something from Trustmark and then we contacted Trustmark and they said they were waiting for something for Green Homes Grant. But if that's the result, that would be great. Yeah, they're two different matters. The, the first is that you need to be recognized by the administrator and they, they will then send um, through the API information back to us and that's when you get the button identified. Um, and that's what, that will create you as an installer that LEN allows lodgement. So if the once you get to that point, if you've got work that's been allocated through a voucher, then you'll have that work ready to be able to lodge because it'll be identified. I'm, I'm not entirely sure I understand, but I'm sure I can speak to William and ask him. He said that we're supposed yeah. to have, we have a yeah. button the, 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 to lodge for ECO. And he yeah, was... Rachel, the easiest way, drop, drop me a note and then I'll get somebody to engage directly with you. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you. Um, we're, we're getting through these questions fairly, fairly uh, rapidly. Um, uh, we've then got a number of questions from Ryan Elsie on the vouchers uh, and the uh, issues with quotes. Um, uh, some of these have been answered, um, uh, so I'm just trying to nip through them. Um, uh, what, uh, uh, what is the justification for the breakdown in materials uh, and labour? Um, we operate on a clear fixed price uh, uh, as businesses usually do, and we don't charge extra for extra parts, etc. cetera. Um, uh, we're having to switch our method um, for doing all our quotes and um, our, the way that our industry works is having to change, um, spe specifically listing every part being used instead of just fixed price for the measure. Um, what is the need for the split out of labour and parts? And also a similar question was, how do we account for uh, profitability uh, within the quotes? Um, the, so what constitutes labour and materials for a quote? And there is nothing on the template to allow for job management. So how do you price for that? Um, so that's just on the quote um, uh, quote issue. So um, I don't know if anyone has any answers on on any of those points. Oh, I think I mentioned this earlier. So we are looking. We are trying to relax those requirements a bit because I appreciate that there is. So we we don't want to get to a point where because there are quotes that have come in that literally say you know heat pump ten thousand pounds. That's very hard for us to sign off because it, you know, there's no information about 
you know, what heat pump it is, why it's costing that much, what other works are included in that. So what we want to encourage people to do is to try and break that down and set out, which many, many of you have done, definitely. Like we've, we've had some really good quotes in as well that have, you know, everything we need in. Um, so we want to, we, you know, we need to encourage transparency so that we can check that a quote is good value for money, that we're not, you know, that we're not paying poor value for money, but also so that we can make sure that the consumers aren't getting ripped off. Because if you could say, well, we're only giving out the £5,000 or £10,000 anyway, it doesn't really matter if it comes in higher than that, but actually it does because we don't want the consumers to be paying more than they have to. So, there's, so that's why we want detailed quotes in. It's, it's so that we can ensure good, we can ensure consumers are protected and also we can ensure that we're, we're giving out grants a good value for money. However, I am aware that the level of detail asked for in the current guidance is excessive. Um, so we are, um, we are working on relaxing that. I think that should, I, I don't know exactly when the change on the guidance is going live, but it will be going live soon. Um, so it, and I think in the meantime, we are trying to be a bit more flexible with our approach to, to, those, to those quotes. Obviously, I can't see on different specific circumstances, so I don't know if you've had a specific request to update a quote. Um, there'll usually be a reason for that. Um, but I know there are some cases where we've been able to get a quote through um, with that the didn't meet every single one of those tick boxes. So I think there are. So I think there are. Um, so it's something that we are trying. It's something that we're, trying, that we're looking at improving the situation on because I appreciate that at the moment we are asking for more than than is practical for people to provide. And I'll, I'll chime in on that too. So we have been uh, directed by Bayes that we don't have to have the costs of labor and, and equipment and materials separated out. Uh, so if there are quotes and invoices that just have it lumped together, we can accept it. But as Ruth said, we really need to have the details around the work that that is being done so as much information as you can provide if you're doing insulation what's the type of insulation what's the the area that's being applied the thickness if it's equipment what's the efficiency that that kind of information is is very helpful for us to understand the nature of the work being done uh, especially if, if all the costs are being lumped into one but but the official policy change on that, um, as Ruth said, is forthcoming. Okay. And I guess on this, I would also say, like, you know, we're, we're, we're responding to your feedback here because we, we've, we, we, you know, from, from what you said last month, we, we, yeah, we, we now understand that what we were asking for was excessive. So we are, we are, we are changing in response to your feedback. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you want to come back on that. Uh, Ryan or uh, any of the other people that asked those questions? Um, there's quite a few of them here. Um, uh, in fact, I've got another question related to that, that uh, from First Eco. Um, uh, our first quotes were uploaded early October uh, with the three month validity, which will be expiring soon. What will happen with these? Um, so should we reissue them before they're rejected? So I, I can chime in on that. I know that there were um, some initial uh, quotes or, or applications that had quotes where the, uh, the expiration date on the quote had passed. The, the scheme itself, the terms and conditions are tied to the voucher issue date. So the three months um, it is tied to the, when the voucher is issued, not to the quote. So I, Ruth, I believe mentioned earlier that um, we're accepting quotes at this point that don't, uh, you know, that have expired the, the date and I don't believe anybody is in, in an immediate uh, threat of the voucher issue three month passing. But again, mm -hmm. we're, we're working with everybody. So we'll, I, if we I'm, run I'm, into a situation, we'll-, we'll I'm going to come this. back on that, um, David, if I may, because um, I have had um, a, a couple of comments from people saying that that information does not seem to be fed back to the help desk. 
um, when they're talking to the help desk, the help desk are basically forcing them to redo the the vouchers, uh, redo the quotes, uh, give them to the homeowner, and um, what, so what what is the process of in, in, uh, basically making sure that information is put down to the the green home grants support team? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid these are live changes. So they've only happened in the last couple of days. So some will probably have gone out with, um, with yeah, will have will have probably gone out asking for updates that perhaps I think maybe we've now changed what we need on. Okay. If I if if I could just come in just very very quickly, um, probably the biggest emails um set that I've had this week is my voucher has been rejected because of ex the expiry on the time of the voucher. Um, that has been the biggest concern, I think, this week overall. Um, that's, just a, that's just a comment, really, um, rather than, you know, it's an FYI, rather than anything else. But it is obviously a concern out there that is being um, met by a lot of people rather than a, just a, a, a single instance. Yeah, I'm afraid basically a batch of these went out um, and then before we were aware that this was happening. So as soon as we found that it was aware, or we became aware, we've now changed changed the, what's happening here. Um, I don't know, David, I'm not sure how, how whether, whether the, because I know if the emails have already gone out telling people that these, telling people that more quotes, that additional, that quotes need to be updated, I'm not sure what the process is now for going out to them. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have to check on that myself. Okay. Um, I don't... Can, I, can, I, can I perhaps jump in and assist oh. with... Yeah, that, thank you, Andre. Yeah. Uh, um, just having had an email now from a customer uh, telling me that uh, the Green Home Grants voucher scheme have written to them to say that the installer quote has expired. So that's still happening. And it's happening every day, and and I'm really glad to hear, you know, the 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 support and the good intentions and all that. But you know, we've spent sixty thousand uh, pounds getting ready for this. Uh, we we haven't seen any money coming in on on this grant. There's one one hundred fifty five days since the grant was announced. There's 55 days since our first session, currently organized by the Energy Efficiency Association. There's 29th of temperature close to freezing since the 1st of November. Um, there's 20 days since our first job was completed. We did a job immediately as soon as the first voucher was issued. Um, and it still hasn't been inspected. Um, this morning I was called on a job, loft installation job in Staines for a, the loveliest older lady that I've met recently. And she was fearful in fear that she will end up having to pay the whole amount because of all this uncertainty that's been bestowed on us and on. Uh, on 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 customers, I had to say to her, "Don't worry. If you end up having to pay for all of it, I will pay for it. But we shouldn't have to take those kind of risks, it, especially after it's gone out, hired people, spend money, and it's it's really nice to see the support that we get. And thank you to Ruth for your positivity and support, which is which comes through and thank you so much and thanks uh, you know to everyone in this but um uh, and to david and to that but it's just taking too long and we we can't really be you know forced to just wait and prop up this system which is not going to i, I don't know when it's going to happen you know it's christmas coming i believe more in santa than i believe in the green home grants um Let's let's get the blockers. Let's get the blockers. Find them there, and get them out of the way. Let us do work and pay us for it, um, because that's just 
is is unsustainable uh, and i'm really certain of everyone's good intentions um but it's that's not going to pay the bills or the christmas wages of staff which now i'll probably have to go and remortgage my home to be able to pay the wages of the people that i've employed for this scheme um it's and i'm really trying to be to be positive um and i'm sure everyone is um but let's let's get the basic rights a lot of these things i and it's really great to hear you know the the policy direction from trustmark and thank you simon for taking us through that and it's really reassuring but i think what we want to hear is the nitty gritty uh being addressed and maybe trustmark is a bit too high so maybe we need someone another organization brought to work alongside trustmark an organization that represents the installers and understands the in and outs the little nitty gritty detail you know that they struggle with because a lot of the problems that are coming through could have been foreseen had that happened and i don't know how gary and ken feel about that but I, I i think they should take a more active role um in rolling this out and again i'm really grateful for everyone's help and all that but we need be, being bailed out is that serious we need the industry needs bailing out not bail, bailing out because of covid disaster we need being bailed out because of unfortunately the delays relating to the green home grants and one last point um the things that i hear from everyone is that it's installers providing the wrong information uh, simon from trustmark referred to the wrong data being supplied the system to lodge vouchers still doesn't work so that's a myth that says installers are not providing the correct information uh, we need the lodgement thing to work so we can do the work lodge the voucher and then get paid for it um Th uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Just one, Kenneth, on that one, please. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And Andre, yeah, I absolutely take the points you're making. All right. And I think everybody on this call does. The lodgement system is functional. All right. No. No. As of this morning, it is. As of, uh, maybe oh, it's fine. Andre, can I just finish? You add your piece. No, Give me no, a few no, minutes, sorry. please. Okay. No, I'm sorry. Let's just be clear. I think we received an email this morning to say that it is now functional. We still have to test that. Um, but maybe as of this morning, it's, it's functional. So, so if, so. On the front of my call, I'm really sorry, but I said at the very beginning, we received last night 4,000 vouchers that came through. All right. You could not lodge because there was no voucher detail. That's about audit. That's about compliance. That was about it. So the lodgement system does work. It works for ECO. It works for Green Home Grant. All right. And... You know, and, and I take your point about data and I take your point about lots of other things, but we're now auditing against 2030, 17, 2030, 19. All right. And let's not beat around the bush. This, this, you know, what we see and what we're seeing on all these areas, we have got to make sure, OK, is compliant. And that's what we have to do. So, you know, I think there's there's a, a whole piece here about getting this right. And everybody on this call, I'm hoping, wants the job done right first time. Yeah, they don't want consumer detriment. They don't want anything from the past to come and haunt us again. So that's why it's got to be right. And I'm sorry, but that, that's, you know, I know it's hard and I, I do get what you're saying. I really do. I get lots of calls similar to what you've said. All right. And we are working with Bayes. We're working with ICF to make these things happen. Thank you, Simon. I appreciate it. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I wanted to correct my own timing, but indeed, as of this morning, we received an email to say that the automation is now working. So fingers crossed. And thank you for your kind words, Simon.
I just want to say, Andre, that's actually why I haven't come back to your email yet, because I was hoping that I'd be able to come back today and say, ah, it's okay, the system's gone live now. <laughs> I, was, I was chasing it up last night trying to find out what happened. Um, so uh, when I, yes, and I hadn't had anything back when I logged off last night, but it looks like it went live overnight. So, um, so hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll be able to get all those jobs lodged now and, and, and progress into payment for them, which hopefully will get, get things moving. Uh, Very great, thank you. Uh, I don't know if anyone uh, else wants to come back on that subject. So I know there's lots of comments going through the the chat session, but I just thought I'd open that up just in case there's anyone else that wanted to come in there. Uh, still one question from me, please. Uh, sorry. <laughs> well, yeah. If there's an inspection which has got to happen after the job, I understand for the first few jobs, uh, and there's now holding payment uh, on at least one of our jobs. I don't know why the inspection takes time, but okay, there's almost Christmas, it's cold outside, uh, there's COVID, there's so many things. Um, is it possible for us to be paid before the inspection takes place so we can get on with our work? Um, what, what's the position on, on that? Sorry, David, I think that's one for you, isn't it? That's uh, the, the ICF inspection. Uh, I was checking on something else and I wasn't I wasn't listening. Could you say it again? Well, it, it's, it, it's about the inspection, uh, David. Um, um, I didn't know to address it to the question too. So it's the, the ICF inspection that takes place after the job. And yeah, it's... That, that's holding back payment. I don't know, there's probably 10 other things that will hold it back uh, as well, but that's the thing that we spot in now that, okay, we, we aren't paid because the inspection hasn't yet taken place. So, can I think one of, I was gonna say, I think one of Andre's, um, one of Andre's installations has been, has been waiting 15 days for an inspection. I don't, I think you said in your email, didn't you? So I'm not quite sure what, what's happened to the delay there. I, David, you're probably not the right person to know the ins and outs of, of those inspection, if the inspection uh, setups, so perhaps you could um, find out that would probably be the yeah, what, why that one's been pushed back so far. Because I like, typically they're supposed to be happening a bit quicker than that, aren't they? They, they are, yeah. And and I have been working with Andre to try and, and figure that one out. Um, I don't have an answer just yet, but it should be. It should have no. been scheduled, or it should be no. being scheduled at this point. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would also say that, that it'll only be the very early vouchers that we'll be get that we're all hitting inspections. Um, the later vouchers you've had, if you can do them through the Sightline app, well, not as many of them will be triggering inspections. So some of them should be able to go through quicker than this one. And yeah, I can only apologize for the fact that this has been delayed. Um, uh, Nick, uh, can Kenneth, sorry, can I just interject quickly because yeah. I have to disappear, I'm afraid. I did send sure. you a name. Yep. Is, no, is I, there anything in particular anybody wants from me or Trustmark? Unfortunately, I've got other commitments. I, I don't have an, uh, a specific Trustmark questions left, um, but if anyone, anyone else out there has one? Kenneth, can I ask Simon a quick question? Sure. You can. Uh, yeah. With regard to retrofit coordination and the Green Home Voucher Scheme, am I, will I be able to still lodge, register the jobs through my core logic app because it's 2013-19? That is a very good question. I, I will get the answer in for you. I don't know, but I will find out for you. I, I, I know core logic have been sitting working on it too, but yeah, um, I just need because to check that it will work. Manually, that yeah. Yeah, okay. okay, thanks. Brilliant. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Simon. All right, um, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Thanks. Bye, um, Simon. Uh, I'm afraid I've literally got another two minutes as well. I'm, I'm yeah. due somewhere else at half 12. Right. Well, uh, so, Can yeah. you just ask that one from Ryan from City, please, Ken? We, yeah, we, well, we only have two more questions that I was going to ask. But, uh, Ryan Frasetti was asking, um, can we subcontract uh, to a PAS 2030 Trustmark registered uh, subcontractor or do they need to be Green Home, Home Grant registered as well? 
That is a good question. Um, so I would, so normally, um, so this is something that we're actually changing the position in the terms and conditions on anyway, um, because I think at the moment subcontracting in the terms and conditions is not in line with what's in the standards. And so we are bringing it in line with the standards. Um, I don't, I, it actually it is, I've unfortunately we've, the terms and conditions, ha I was hoping it would have gone live yesterday, but it didn't. Um, it is due, but it is due the new, the new vision terms and conditions that allows for subcontracting is meant to be going live, uh, like ASAP, um, certainly begin by the beginning of next week. Um, so that should, so that may be, so that isn't quite the question you're asking. Um, but that does, um, I know that would, I think, I think that that will also answer your question because actually it will enable any form of subcontracting as long as you have the standards and registrations that you need. Um, so I'm afraid that doesn't quite answer your question, but I think that is maybe a, a wide, an answer to a wider question that hopefully also answers that question. Um, okay then, so in a nutshell, we can subcontract to another past 2030, 17 installer, but I wouldn't say we recommended to just subcontract to anyone. That just wouldn't be wise, would it? Um, so the, the position in the standards, uh, well, you'll all know better than me, but the position in the standards is that you can subcontract as long as you, because as, as long as the you as the primary contractor contain the, maintain all the responsibilities for it and supervise them adequately in all the things that the, the standard requires. So we're bringing the scheme requirements in line with those um, those requirements in the standard because at the moment, yes, you could only you could only subcontract to someone else who was also PAS, PAS certified and or NCS certified, which in practice would mean well, why weren't they just doing the job? So it's a kind of a you know so we're um um so yes you could you could subcontract to someone else who is who is um who is PAS certified at the moment, um but we're actually changing. The, we're bringing it into line with the standards to say that you can subcontract to anyone because you retain responsibility for it and for all the consumer protections that are in place. Okay, so in a, in a nutshell, if I've got a multi-measure property, so a cavity wall, um, obviously it needs a different accreditation and somebody then wants a heating control and some IWI, not everybody holds all those accreditations. So if, let's say, for example, you're not EWI accredited, could somebody then... Could you use that that pass because the guarantee has to be in someone's name, doesn't it? That's the only point I'm trying to make. Ruth, well, we're not hearing you, Ruth. You're sorry, you mic off. Sorry, there. <laughs> Turn myself off there. Um, so, yeah, what I was trying to say, what I was trying to say, <laughs> was that um, yeah, in that situation, so you do one application. Actually, you actually have multiple vouchers. So the vouchers would be issued in the names of the relevant. Has certified contractor, so you would need it would need to be someone who was certified for, see the internal wall insulation. They would their name would need to be on the voucher. It needs to be with the, yeah. So the the name on the voucher needs to be the name of the contractor who is appropriately certified, whether they are. However, you operate that amongst yourselves. Okay. Um, I'll put in an email to make it clear for you. But thank you very much. Yeah, I appreciate that. Sorry, it's hard to explain. Let me. I'll. 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 I'll, I'll write this down so that it's clear and send it out to you. If you could. If you do. You, do you have my contact details? To... Um, no. If you pass them on to Gary, you'll forward them on to me. Yeah. No, and then. And then. I'll, and then just drop me an email, and I'll, I'll get something out to you in writing that makes it clear. It might be helpful to be honest if I sent it out. If we sent it out to everyone anyway, because like, you're probably not the only person with this question. So I'll let me. Um, let, let me write this down so that it's clear and then, I'll, and then we'll get it sent out. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, and final question, which is a question from Bill Snide from Home Sun and from Emma Bohan as well. Um, uh, Emma has asked, we have a client in a cul-de-sac, her and her three neighbours are considering the possibility of a mini network with one grain source heat pump for all uh, properties can they use their one voucher towards each project as a whole and Bill's asking can we get clarification on how the voucher scheme is supposed to work for measures that can only be applied to an entire building as opposed to individual flats within that building uh, such as cavity wall or EWI. 
So those are not questions I'm going to be able to answer in the 30, in, uh, given I'm already out of time. They're, they're, they're quite long questions. Can I suggest, um, if you send those to me, I'll follow up on writing in those, because there are, yeah, there's, um, yeah they're, they're both quite, quite long and complicated answers, I'm afraid. Okay. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, I don't think we'll detain you any longer. Um, we will wish you a very Merry Christmas and a good New Year, and hopefully... Um, I suspect we'll I'm going to be working to sort out some of these uh, some of these challenges you're all facing. But yes, let's uh, well, let's hope we're in a better place by next time we speak. Well, ho hopefully we can get most of them sorted before Christmas. Um, if there's anything as the association we can do to help, please do not hesitate to contact, contact us. Um, and um, I, I would just like to say thank you for your help, and hopefully we'll see you in the new year when we organise another one of these in January. Thank you all very much. I'll speak to all, I'm, sh I'm sure, after Christmas, if not before. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Um, I think, Gary, you wanted to say a few words? Um, yeah, just to, uh, to say thank you, um, all of you, for supporting the Zoom calls. I think they're very important. And as long as there is um, the need for the industry, and of course, it's a value to David, Ruth, and Simon will continue to do these one one a month, uh, but there has to be value. You know, what I don't want to do is keep repeating the same questions all the time and it gets laborious because then people just won't turn up. Um, I want to just put in one thing which actually works along with the, um, the time scale of this particular scheme. And that is that the Energy Efficiency Association is going to be a kickstart gateway. Now, I've already spoken to a few people about this, and if you're unaware of it, basically it is for 16 to 24 year olds on universal credit. And the government's got a program out whereby um, you can have them for 25 hours a week minimum, um, and they will pay. So minimum wage, um, NI, and of course, um, the pension side will all be paid and you can have them for six months. Now, the important thing is, of course, they are not to replace people. They are, they are new jobs. But of course, with this scheme now starting to function, there are opportunities for you to treat them as they're like interns almost. Um, and effectively, you know, you can have a trainee loft installer, you can have a trainee DEA, you can have someone on the app. You know, there are a number of things that over a six month period, you could use these people for. Now, along with that, there is also an opportunity that you would be given a thousand pounds to put money into life skills training. We have someone here um, with us that you can optionally lock, lock into to do that. So, or CVs and that sort of thing. Um, but you can buy them protective equipment, boots, hard hats, high vises, computer stuff, you know. You have to spend that money on the recruitment side, which of course part of it will go to the association. Um, but there is money available to you. You can have these free for six months. And if you get these people, you know, they're 16 to 24 year olds, you could bring them on and, and, and they can help you. And if you if you put some time into and train them, you know, these could be your workforce that we already know of a number of people have talked talk to me and said, you know, I'd, I'd really like to move forward with all of this, but I can't find the people to do it. Well, contact me and we'll find the people for you. You know, we're all set up as a gateway to do this. Um, I will be very transparent with you. I asked for 120 quid to sign up with our gateway. And we have a certain amount of money, obviously, that we keep back. But you don't actually actually pay it. That's the funny thing about it. You know, the money that we get from government, yeah, we will send you a thousand pounds for taking these people to help with their advancement. What on earth have you got to lose? It's it's a no-brainer, you know. So I expect a lot of emails saying to me, Gary, uh, can we have people for this? Can we have people for that? I will then speak to you, get you booked onto the scheme with us, 
we expect to place hundreds of people in line with this scheme to help with the opportunity that we now are starting to see, and I think more so in January. Um, and we've got, you know, until March 2022. Well, this scheme runs until December 2021. And you have for six months. So, you know, right up till October next year, you can be taking people on for six months for nothing. You just got to give them a bit of time and a bit of encouragement and a bit of help. You know, and we could really, re there's going to be two and a half million people. They're, they're saying they're going to lose their jobs. Our industry could mop up a lot of those people. We could be the cure of it all. Yeah. All we got to do is get on with it. Look, I found the day really positive. Out of all four of them, I think today has been far more positive than all the other three put together. We've, we've, we've looked at things, we've given a bit, you know, Park Homes have had a bit of an airing. Um, hopefully you guys can get together, start moving that along. We're starting to see vouchers coming out, which, you know, we always know it's like a car. You cure one problem, another one comes along. Um, but it's, it's knocking it down the road a little bit. Slowly it's actually starting. I'm starting to see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. I just please ask you all stick with it it will work in the end i'm sure of it we've got people involved now like david um it's american dave i believe um you know you're the main man now man um you're really helping people i've heard so many good things about what you've done and i thank you so much for getting involved with what we're doing um, gary sorry what's it called gateway what is it it's called Kickstarter. Kick I'm Gary at Energy Efficiency Association. Yeah. Co. Uk. All I need to know is how many people you want, and I'll yeah. talk to you about it, and yeah. and I'll we'll find the people for you. It's a great you know, initiative, mate. Great initiative. That is. It's, it's just something that we've got to really get involved with here. Mm. It's a no-brainer. But yeah, it's you know. I want to say to everybody, thank you so much for being on the first four. We're going to do another one in January. Uh, probably towards the end of January, to be honest with you, because we need to get people to come back and just work out what they're doing. I'm sure I'll talk to a lot of you in the meantime. Um, anybody who's not a member of the association that's on this call, um, you should be. You should join. Because, you know, how many other people have got the administrator involved with what they're doing? I've got Bayes involved with what they're doing. I've got Trustmark, all of them together. How many people are doing this? Yeah, we're doing this for you. Yeah, we can do this together. The industry has the answers. It's very, very simple. We just got to collaborate. We got to communicate. I wish you all a wonderful Christmas. We'll be in touch, obviously, um, to let you know what's going on uh, in the very near future. If you need me for anything, you've either got my phone number or you've got my email. Please don't hesitate to contact me because I'm here to help. I want to thank Kenneth. Um, for um, doing all the questions. It's a bit that I didn't want to do. Uh, so I'll pass the buck on that. So I do apologise, Ken. Uh, but you've done it very well, mate. So well done. Um, and uh, I want to thank everyone for having me. So um, with that, I'd like to say Merry Christmas. Thank you all. And uh, I'm going to sign off. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye now. Cool. Uh, I just want to add thank you very much to everyone and wish you all a Merry Christmas as well. Um, and um, especially I want to thank uh, David, who's um, still, uh, still uh, on it. it, remained after everyone else has disappeared. And I know he's got up very early in the morning to be on this call. So thank you very much. And um, uh, we will hopefully speak to you all in the new year. Um, can, I also, beforehand. can I also thank David as well, because he's, I mean, it's, he's probably getting up between four and five in the morning to come on these calls. And the amount of hours and work he's been doing to help in stores, we should all appreciate it. And I'd like David to know it. we do appreciate it because I think things have moved a lot in the last four months, in the last four weeks since the last Zoom. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Thank you.
Definitely do. And, all, and also a big thank you to Gary because obviously Gary is the driving force behind this and we've spoken quite a lot. There was a huge amount regarding collaboration that we can all do to get everything put together in the manner that we want it to be. Um, so as Gary reiterated, if you're not a member, join. I've got other options that we're looking to as well regarding re-education of former ex-forces personnel, former emergency services personnel that we can bring back into the fold with regards to putting everything that we need together to make this work as it should be. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Ian. Uh, and um, uh, uh, I shall, with that, say to you, and apologies that we didn't get through everyone's questions, but there have been a lot. And um, uh, just keep sending them our way, and we will try and get answers for you as best we can. So thank you very much, everyone. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year all. Thank you. Bye.